Hey everybody, welcome to module two of our web literacy work. In this module, we're going to take a look at participating online. Um, we label it as online collaborative inquiry, but let's dig in a little bit deeper. So when we look at online collaborative inquiry, what we're talking about is a group of local or global learners who are co-constructing information to reach a common outcome using multiple pathways of knowledge. So what that really means is, let's say you have a classroom of students and they're using digital text and tools to collaborate. They're in the same space, but they're really working in this third space, this digital space, um, to collect and, and construct knowledge. Um, they might be adding materials to a class wiki. They might be researching together online and, re and reflecting in their own blogs or a common blog. But you could have a group of local learners working on that common outcome, co-constructing, um, you know, multiple pathways of knowledge, multiple pathways of knowledge, meaning that they could all learn different things and that's okay. Um, and then the, the global part is it's important to remember that once we take our students from the face to face to the online or we use these digital tools, one of the things that's important to remember is that it's, it's not that much of a leap to move from local learning or local nodes of, of connection to global. Um, and so you could have students that are in your class researching a topic and putting materials on a class wiki, but they could also be using digital text and tools or ICTs to reach out to other classrooms or other experts out there online using the internet as a tool. One of the reasons why this is important or one of the reasons why this is a challenge is obviously our literacy practices are changing. Um, you know, many of us grew up with the use of the internet um, or the internet entered our lives as we were you know growing up um, and it has had a profound effect on the ways in which we socialize communicate connect um, it, it has a profound impact on our literacy practices and the way that we interact uh, with other individuals in terms of online collaborative inquiry um, one of the reasons why i feel that this is very important um, is when we look at college and career readiness skills and we think about preparing our students for the future of work. Part of the challenge is that our students are preparing for jobs, for careers that probably don't even exist yet. Um, and so it's important to remember that they need to be flexible. We're moving to a, a, you know, a world where much of our job force and much of the ways in which we quote unquote work is distributed. So you might be at home doing work. Um, you might never see uh, your colleagues or peers other than virtual spaces, or you might see them every day and then do stuff virtually online. Um, in my own work, you know, I'll put together Google Docs and I will write and collaborate with colleagues. Some of them I see every day and others I've never met face to face, but we work together, we research together, we use the internet as a tool to conduct our work and that's all about participating with others online. This also has other profound changes to the future of work. Um, if we take a look at the work that we're conducting right now, you know, I am recording this video, I am seated at a computer, I've got a mic, I've got a headset, I've got two monitors just like this. Um, I don't have that red looking light in the background or paint or whatever that is. I wish I did. It looks pretty fancy. Um, but I am sitting here recording these materials for you. You're consuming them at some place. You know, you could be at home. You could be on the, you know, walking and listening. Um, but for me, this is, you know, my job. Um, and so as educators, we need to think about, okay, well, if our students are there with us face to face, there's certain things that we need to think about and ways we need to interact and ways that we, you know, participate with them or we have them participate with each other. But if we teach in a virtual learning space, or if we teach in an online or a hybrid school, this is the sort of future that we might be looking at. This is a challenge. Um, there are also opportunities, but this is a challenge because, you know, globally, we increasingly use the internet to connect and collaborate and communicate with others. And so that means people near you, it means people on the other side of the planet, it means people that have the same ideologies and epistemological beliefs and stances that we do, but it also means that you're going to come into contact with people that don't uh, believe or agree with you. And in our classroom or in our school, 
we would have a problem if students didn't listen to the the voices and the input and the um, the the, uh, the perspectives of other students. Um, we would have a problem if you know there was a student in our building that was not allowed to speak because of different um, identities or contexts. But the problem is, what do we do in online spaces? Do we still hold these truths to be self-evident that other people can basically speak up and speak out? Um, and so that's one of the challenges. And then also we're preparing our students to grow up and live in this world. And there's also extreme questions about privacy and security in these spaces. We know that governments and data, uh, governments and business are sucking up our data. We know that they're basically collecting all of this to create profiles on us. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we, you know, ourselves get out there online and we participate and we communicate with others? What does that mean when, you know, we get our students ready to go out and use these tools? What does it mean as our students use, you know, Google Apps or they have a blog? How do we ensure that they have, you know, a recent uh, opportunity, a recent, a decent opportunity for privacy and security? So very real questions that we need to think about. Um, and ask ourselves and, and, and you know, make sure that we have a, a pretty good answer for. This is also, you know, literacy is a form of, of identity construction. Um, you know, we are, part of what we are is, is the languages that we use, it's the cultures that we associate with, it's our identity that we construct over time. And literacy and language is a huge component of that. This is also true in digital spaces. We have this false dichotomy that there is the face-to-face -face version of us and then the online or digital version of us. But the truth of the matter is that in many ways they're one and the same. Um, and so we have questions about our digital identity and the ways in which we represent ourselves and also our future students. What impact do these digital texts and tools have on their identity? And how can we help them shape their identity? So who, uh, you know, however they want to represent themselves, however they want to position themselves, how are we helping them do this using digital tools? And above all, the, the main question that I have and the main question that you should have in this class is how are we off, uh, you know, <laughs> how are we effectively and authentically reflecting these changes? So we see these drastic changes happening to our society because of the internet and these communication technologies. How are we making sure that this is evidenced by what's happening in our classroom? Are we still teaching the way that we taught years and years and years ago? Or is our instruction, is our pedagogy, is that all reflective of what's happening on a larger societal level? The way that I look at this um, is through the web literacy map. Um, this is undergoing drastic changes over time. Um, and you know, you can find out more online about this. Um, but the key components here is we're pretty much looking at, you know, exploring or navigating, building or creating, and connecting or participating. So in this module, we're really looking at this connecting strand. We're looking at sharing, collaborating, community participation, being a good citizen of the, of the internet, privacy is, is embedded in here, and then also open practices. If we look at the web literacy map um, presented a different way, um, if we look at this, we see that participate again, that write, that read. Um, here we are in this participate lens, but we see that you know the way they intersect is this module we're looking at participate, which is connecting the online collaborative inquiry, and in the two other um, areas of this web literacy map, we're going to look at reading or exploring and writing or building. But we'll look at those in other modules. In participate, once again, our focus is on a group of local or global learners. So they can be kids that are in your class working with each other using digital tools. They could be using the internet and these digital texts and tools to connect outside of the classroom. Um, and they're arriving at a common outcome and having uh, using multiple pathways of knowledge. So different ways to get to the same address, uh, but then it's also absolutely appropriate for them to get to different addresses, for them to learn different things. Um, and so how do we sort of like build that in and provide these opportunities? And fundamentally, what does it mean to participate 
in in our classroom but also in the the futures in the future lives of our students what does it mean for them to participate um, you know this is a little bit of connecting this is a little bit of collaboration this is a little bit of socialization um, you know but how do we think about that how do we want our kids to be able to leave our classroom you know and participate as you know functioning members of society what does that really mean so there are some tools and different pedagogical affordances of these tools um, that I've used over time. Wikispaces is a tool that uh, I've used in the past and love. Um, sadly, Wikispaces will die as will uh, as many other digital tech tools die. Uh, it'll die at the end of July in 2018. So as I'm recording this video now, I've got about two weeks. Um, and this is a good point for me to remind people you know, I, I usually push for open source tools in my classes. I push students to use tools like WordPress. And the real reason is, you know, Wikispaces, I have a lot of materials built into it, but then they change their business model and they are going out of business or transitioning. So all of my content, they're deciding to take down. Um, whereas if I use an open source tool like WordPress, I, you know, the community owns it. So other tool, other businesses and entities can pick that up and run with it. Uh, I also recommend checking out Padlet. Um, there are different tools that are really fun to use with uh, thinking about participation. Padlet is a great tool. Google Groups for discussion groups is on there. Blogger is there. I'd also recommend tools like Flipgrid. I'm using Flipgrid a lot more in my research and in my classes. Um, uh, ThingLink is also a fun tool to play around with, but there's a lot of different tools, you know, really, really high tech and really low tech that you can use in your class to help your kids uh, participate with others and connect. So why is this important? One of the reasons why this is important is if you, if you dig back, we talked about multiple pathways of knowledge and your students are basically coming to one common outcome or perhaps learning different things through different you know pathways and so the 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 fun in that is that there is a tension that is created so there is a tension that is created when a student might go learn go seeking one uh, answer and find multiple other answers that are out there I mean that's what life is all about there's not it, it, like things in life are not black or white there's not right or wrong um, and everyone brings their perspectives they bring their ideologies to learning and to the discussion and so we basically inject our students and and our learning into this um, this uh, dialectic we we add them into this field where we see you know we have the the antithesis of, a, of an idea of a product and that tension brings real world opportunities to synthesize and figure out okay well what do I think so if I if I read something about you know global change or climate change and I read something and I and I read one side of the story and the other side of the story well what do I think and what's quote unquote true and that's a powerful opportunity that's learning that we should be having in our student in our classrooms this is also important because we're unpacking that local global dialectic you know technology has the opportunity to break down the classroom walls it has the opportunity to allow our kids to get out there and connect and learn and socialize with other people that might not be like them and so through technology we can sort of okay let's learn here in-house but then every once in a while let's dip out and and connect with another class on the other side of the planet this is not new you know I grew up in a classroom where we had pen pals so we teamed up with a, a class of students you know, in Africa, and, and we would send uh, it, mail to them, and they would send me a little a letter back, and they would send me something from their, their home, you know, or from their village, and I would send them back like a baseball card. This is not new at all. Um, you know, having pen pals, using digital tools as to have pen pals is not new at all. But now we can really be creative, and we can sort of really expand our horizons with that. This is also important because you'll, when you research online, you'll you'll hear a lot about connected learning and connected classrooms, and so the the fun thing with this is that 
we can sort of like go through this dialectic where or this design process where we sort of like research and access information we sort of modify and identify the specific information that helps us we can evaluate those processes and we can uh, figure out how an answer might suit our needs and then kick that back into our research process again so as an example i had a student that had a unit plan and they were looking at sustainability and recycling and so this teacher had students basically go online and research well how do other countries and places deal with recycling and then they looked at the local level and researched how is recycling handled in their local town um, and then they really drilled down and they looked at the school and they looked at how the custodial staff in the school recycled and they started a, a new recycling effort and awareness program in the school and this was all informed by you know ideas out there in the world and what other towns and areas were doing and then their school so it's a really important way uh, powerful way to connect what's happening in your classroom to what's happening out there in the world so how do we do this one of the challenges that we we feel as we integrate technology is that there's just too much out there um, and so for me there's a couple lenses that I use to sort of make sense of integration and technology the first of these is really the SAMR model. Um, so there's a couple different models that we'll talk about and we'll unpack and, and they're in the readings. Um, but the SAMR model for me is important because it thinks about how we slowly add and embed technology into our classroom or into instruction. So if we have an individual learning activity, um, is that use of technology a substitution? Is it an augmentation? Is it a modification or a redefinition? So as an example, in many of my classes, I use an open source tool called Hypothesis to have my students read and annotate texts for my classes. Um, and so a normal class, a normal instructor would basically say, go buy this book. It's at the library or it's at the bookstore. Go buy this, read chapter one, come back in class. Now go read chapter two, come back in a class. Sometimes there would be quizzes about whether or not you read. Sometimes there would just be a, a reading grade or no grade at all. But there was a, this assumption that you read and that you were basically, um, you know, following along with what the, the instructor was talking about. So I use hypothesis where we actively mark up and annotate text and we, we have discussions about the text baked into the text. And so one of the things that I usually ask my students is, where in this continuum is a practice like that because i'm i'm asking students to read a different way and it causes some consternation for students so is that a use of tech as a substitution am i augmenting augmenting uh the learning task the reading there am i modifying so am i in my in my look in my views of reading as learning am i modifying that practice through the use of hypothesis, or am I totally redefining the task? Am I redefining that, hey, you need to read for class, am I redefining it? So where in this continuum does that exist? Um, and it's a way for me to think and then also reflect with students about well, what am I doing? Looked at, uh, examining this SAMR model a different way, usually I look at, okay, are you uh, basically enhancing instruction or are you transforming instruction? So this is basically the SAMR model presented a different way, a little bit cleaner, you know, and you want to think about, all right, at a basic level, is this enhancement or transformation? Then we can drill down into specifically, what are you doing? I can tell you from doing this a long time, it's hard to get into this transformation area. Many of my students, many of my colleagues say, well, normally I would have, you know, I have PowerPoints in class and now I put the PowerPoints online. Okay. Or normally I have PowerPoints, now I use Google Slides. Okay, are you substituting? Are you augmenting? Is there some functional improvement? Or is there transformation of the task? So these are questions that you have to ask yourself and, and continuously push for moving into this transformation area. We can do incredible things with technology if we try. I also really use uh, the TPAC model 
as a way to think about and frame technology uh, integration. And for me, why the reason why TPAC is very powerful is that it gives you a lot of credit for things that you already know. A lot of times with technology, we think, you know what, there's too much to learn. There's too many things to deal with. There's too many tools. I'm overwhelmed. And, and when I work with educators, I say, look, here's the deal. You know pedagogy or you're constantly learning about pedagogy, the, the science of teaching and learning. You should know your content knowledge. So if you're a seventh grade science teacher, you should know science content, science, you know, knowledge in that area, and also seventh grade science knowledge and, and whatever the, the specific curriculum is or the areas or the focus for seventh grade science in your state or your district, you should know that. That's not my job to teach you. But we know that there is PCK. We know that there's a way that you have pedagogical knowledge and content knowledge and how those overlap. So there's really good ways to teach and also really bad ways to teach seventh grade science. We know that and you come in with that already and I'm adding this lens of technology. So are there specific ways that technology helps you with pedagogy? You know, there's good ways to teach and bad ways to teach through the integration of tech. Yeah, there are. Uh, for content knowledge, are there specific uses of technology that are really good for science or seventh grade science? Yeah, there are. There are some things that are some technological uses that are better for seventh grade science or science in general than ELA and reading, you know, or art. It's just are. And then when you overlap all these, the sweet spot is this middle area. So when we sort of look at PCK, the pedagogy, the content knowledge, and then add in the technology, what's the sweet spot? That's what we're, we're sort of digging at. We'll also talk a lot about the ISTE standards for students um, and, and what we're trying to have students do. You'll recognize that in, this, in this, these modules, in this web literacy series of modules that I've given you, I've boiled it down to three areas. And there's a reason for that. I'm trying to get to first principles but you'll notice a lot of these other competencies built into that. There's also the ISTE standards for educators, that's you. Um, and so that's having you think about how are you using these digital texts and tools to not just read, write, and participate, but how are you using these digital texts and tools to be a designer, to collaborate, to be a learner, a leader, or an analyst? Um, how are you trying to be a good citizen online? Um, so how are you doing these different things to try and make sure that you are representative of an educator in, in this technologically advanced network society. So once again, we're looking at the, the web literacy map. We're using this as a way to think through uh, uses of technology and embedding these literacy practices into our work, but also the, the work of our students. Uh, this module we looked at participating um, and there's a lot of different complexity and different parts to it. Um, you will see it referred to as online collaborative inquiry. We'll talk about connecting or connected learning. Um, there is a difference. Um, we'll, we'll look at concepts such as protecting and, and open practice and contributing and sharing. And in other modules we'll look at reading and writing uh, and sort of bring all of this together. Um, so once again, I appreciate you taking the time to take uh, listen and, and learn a little bit about participating or online collaborative inquiry, and I'll see you in the next module.